say a word or two, so I'll make sure the audio is coming in all right. Okay. Um, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's wonderful. All right. <laughs> this is good. I can't wait. This is going to be really good. Um, well, what do you think? Should we just dive right in? Let's dive right in. All right. Mr. Turner, thanks for being on my show. Thank you, Luke. Yeah. Uh, who would have thought that in 2020 you would be a, a featured guest on a podcast of all, all things here in Fairfield, Iowa? Yes. I mean, I think uh, if I thought about it much, then I would say, well, this does make sense. And I am not at all feeling like this is some kind of surreal experience. It, it <laughs> feels very real to me and yeah. very uh, valid Good. Um, I, I will say it's kind of surreal for me, but in a really good way. Yeah, yeah, great, right, great. Right. <laughs> Makes me happy. Actually, when I reached out to you about a month ago with the initial inspiration to do a podcast, and I was going through my list of people I would want to talk to, you were right there at the top. Oh, that's and, great. <laughs> and I told you because you had such a profound impact on me as a teacher in middle school and in high school. And I think your teaching style and, and general philosophy in life was just so inspiring. I, I, I'm kind of doing this for me and my friends, my classmates, because I know they're going to love listening to you today, and I know I'm going to get a lot out of it, too. So uh, one thing, all right, you were a history teacher. For how long? Now, I was a history teacher, well, 30-year career in the classroom, and teaching history pretty much, I would say, 28 years of teaching some kind of history, mostly American history. That's great. And was it all here in Fairfield, or...? That's a good question, too. It was 18 years in private schools in New York City, 17 at the Browning School, 52 East 62nd Street, and then one year at the Trevor Day School on the west side, about 88th, 87th on the west side. Uh, and then, yes, nine years at the Maharshi School and three at the Maharshi Institute in Johannesburg, South Africa. That's awesome. Wow. That's, I didn't know that, that history there. All right, so why teaching and why history? That's such a good question. It's really important for every teacher to come to terms with the choice of profession because the truth is teachers are born. They're born. Now, if you're going to say, well, a natural-born teacher is born not made, that's not true because when you understand that you were born to this profession, this is something you can do, you have a native intelligence and ability to do it, you need to work at it. <laughs> you need to gain experience and training and make lots of mistakes. Why do you know that you're a teacher? Because you want to do it well. It's important to you. So my first year of teaching was a disaster. One, one first um, experience teaching fourth graders in uh, English in Manhattan, the Browning School. It was a disaster. Those kids were tying me up. They were absolutely abusing me. They were <laughs> making me furious. I would scream at them for 10 seconds. They'd be quiet for five seconds and go right back to what they were doing. But I wanted to do it well. As much as I dreaded teaching that class, I kept finding myself getting up the next day and wanting to do it well. Hmm. This was important to me. And that would not have been true of a lot of other professions that I may have chosen to, to work in. So, yes, it's a very good question. Uh, did I want to be a teacher? Yes. Uh, did I feel that I came to it naturally with some aptitude for it? Yes. My parents were teachers. But I could go on and on because I didn't really respect the profession. It wasn't, it wasn't cool enough I wasn't going to make enough money. Girls weren't impressed. They would walk in a bar. They would walk away. What do you mean? You're a middle school history teacher. I was looking for a stockbroker. Um, they're not interested, you know? And so it took me about five years to grow up mm. and understand that I was very lucky to be in a profession that I actually loved and mm. wanted to do well. Five years. Mm. The first few years, I had delusions of grandeur of <laughs> yeah. doing something else. I think most people do, especially most when people do yeah. exactly <laughs> when they're that age. That's true. Yeah. Gosh, um, one of the things I, I remember so fondly is is your current events assignment 
Um, let's see, maybe you can help me remember, but I think I had your class in seventh grade, and then I think again in 10th grade. Um, just That's before. interesting, yes. I mean, I think I, had, I definitely had you in ninth and 10th grade. Ninth and 10th, yeah. Yeah, your okay. class was really academically extraordinarily good. It was uh, <laughs> an outstanding class academically. Mm. And one of the reasons I wanted to teach that 10th grade year is I'd never taught American literature. But that year didn't go so well, actually. I really... <laughs> I why, was, why not? Well, I was not really... Um, I didn't have enough experience teaching American literature mm. uh, to to really make. I was sort of doing a lot of trial and error, maybe a little overconfident as a teacher. I've been teaching so long. Oh, I can do this. I've got this. But um, I don't regret doing it. But I wasn't nearly as adroit. Uh, as adept as I was at teaching history, you guys, mm. in ninth grade. Yeah. So that wasn't such a good feeling that I, <laughs> that I finished with you guys not as strongly as I would have liked. Gosh, but yeah, uh, I don't know if that was my experience necessarily. I also, I'll, I'll just mention that I um, uh, kind of ended up following my own path and, and uh, ended up dropping out of school mid-10th grade and got my GED. And I did that with Elia Finkelstein, and another good friend of mine, Nick Yuskevich, who ended up uh, homeschooling. But I feel like I already had gotten like the best parts of my education, which were like from you. And uh, I was all, you know, a lot of us were doing Destination Imagination, which is probably a story for another day, but, you know, extracurricular activities. Um, and then I just like really wanted to go out into the world and start doing stuff. It stands to reason, you know, the, the truth is most intelligent students realize at some point in high school that they're not learning what they need to know. Hmm. What I'm being taught here is not what I need to know. And I'm finding it very hard to understand the relevance of what I'm being taught. Now, Buckminster Fuller, who actually knew Maharshi, a very brilliant guy, yeah. he's the one who formulated that. The reason students can't stand school, especially high school, is they know they're not learning what they need to know. And, you know, as you go through it, you do understand because you're learning life skills. You know, you're learning how to change a tire, how to balance a checkbook. You're learning something about medicine and nutrition. You're learning things that you will need your whole life, but you're not learning them in school. Yeah. And so you begin to see, you know, where school's role is in your education and where it isn't. But I, I don't mean to knock school. I'm just saying no, that's part yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, anyway, I wanted to jump back in on that, yeah, that no initial thought, which was current events. Sure. Which that ongoing assignment that you had us do, I think once a week, was it not, that yep. we, we had to pick a current event and write about it. Uh, and then give a report to some, or did, did we report? Or we yeah, ended up, you would yeah. be selected, exactly. We, we wouldn't get to all of them every day. Yeah. There might be 15, 16, 17 kids. But, and then one particular current event might interest the class so much, we spend most of the class talking about that. I love that. Yeah, yeah it was brilliant. It yeah. was a very, it was distilled from 18 years of teaching experience. The assignment was what I considered to be the best representation of what I thought a good assignment was. Can I just say something about oh, it? Oh, please, though? yeah. Well, see, yeah. it was from all angles. And one thing I did is I said, <clears throat> you know you have this assignment. You have it every Monday. It's your responsibility to turn it in. And it's not my responsibility to remind you. You have no excuse. You have all week to do it. You can't tell me that you were sick on Sunday night and couldn't do it. You could have done it all week. You need to decide when you're going to do that assignment, and you need to remember to bring it in on Monday. You cannot bring it in late unless I know beforehand that you've gotten ill or your family has an emergency, and then, of course, you can't. So I would make the joke. I would say, look, if I'm watching <laughs> CNN on Friday night and I see you in the back of a Jeep somewhere in <laughs> Egypt, handcuffed and blindfolded, if you make it to class on Monday morning, you still have to have this on. You know I love I mean? that. Yeah. So it, and then the idea was that you would summarize the article, 
you would say why it was important and then you would give your point of view and the point of view was the most important thing. Mm. And of course, as you say, the classmates were brilliant. They came yeah. up with unbelievably interesting stuff. So, yeah. yes. That brings up so many memories. Uh, just I, like I'm remembering uh, the charge you gave us. Yeah, that, that you weren't going to remind us. That you made it very clear in the beginning right. that it was once a week. I don't think I had that level of um, trust and autonomy in college. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like I, I really don't. That level of accountability, I think, is so important. I mean, you were, you were helping us grow into, like, fine young men. Yeah. I remember you teaching our class how to give a firm handshake, look the man in the eyes. Yes. You know, that's fantastic. I mean, that's so important for life. I remember your reading of Mice and Men because we were still a little rowdy. Like, I remember you, you delivered it with such um, uh, conviction and passion reading that book to us. And look across the river, Lenny. You know, yes. it's, it's just like... And then some kids in the background were like goofing off. And I think some of us were like, uh, you know, self-governing and just, hey, shut up. <laughs> this is a serious moment in the book, you know? Yes. You'd be surprised how many classes. I read that to at least six classes, maybe more. And it just came as an idea. The first year I taught American history at the Maharshi School was 97, 98, Josh Mead's class. I decided to read it to them, and there were a lot of reasons, American history and American culture, but the nature of friendship and to mm. understand what friendship is and to really understand why these two were friends because they were so incredibly different. You know, one of the guys is 5'7", he's about 42, he's wiry, he's tough, he's street smart, he can be funny, he's very capable, uh, he's a cool guy. The other guy, 6'6", 280 pounds, mentality of probably a five or six year old, uh, not really capable of doing anything except, you know, he's strong so he can lift things and so forth. How did they become friends and what was the friendship dynamic? And then, of course, that it ends so sadly. Yeah. Um, and then I was doing the voices, of course. Yeah, so, which you did very well. <laughs> yeah, which is sort of, my father did that when he read to me. And I knew I could do it. Uh, I mean, I was thinking, you know, George's voice was just a little bit of mine, but Lenny's was sort of like this. <laughs> yeah. George, George, I mean, I can't, I can't do this, George. And so I would do that, and you guys would, with your imaginations, a lot of people, they'd just close their eyes and be imagining this whole thing. And that's a rich experience, and you really can't reproduce that technologically. No, you really can't. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just like part of the oral tradition. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's yeah. really, really important. You're so, tr you're so right about that. <laughs> Gosh. Um, we, we have jokes, too. I mean, uh, for, for the school that we were going to, and of course, uh, reading and, and reciting Sanskrit was part of that tradition. And I just remember, you know, like we still kind of just quote it today, like uh, uh, Bakshi, uh, Thomas, uh, Rickshaw Akshare chart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, I'll just say that when I'm calling my good friend Nick on the phone and he'll be like, oh yeah, Rickshaw Akshare. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I had you do it every day right before class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thomas might be like, uh, I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> Source of real entertainment. Yes, Devin Thomas. Devin Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. What a great. He's another. He's a poet. He is. He's a little bit like you. And uh, in in the business of making video games, I believe. If, if yeah, he'd yeah. be perfect for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, the sort of storytelling and that whole family. They're they're a remarkable family. Each each one of the kids, the parents. Very talented. Very talented. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, gosh, what else can we talk about? Thanksgiving weight challenge. Yes. Yeah, that was very important. Now, you have to understand, uh, you do understand. I would say you have to understand. You yeah, do yeah. understand. One of the reasons that we're probably communicating well on this is you understand that, first of all, what I need to say about my teaching career is you could stop me in the middle of a class teaching history and you could say, yeah. Mr. Turner, everybody freezes. And everything is uh, suspended in time. And you look at me and you go, Jim, where do you want to be? You can be anywhere in your world, anywhere, yeah. anywhere right now. You can be with anybody doing anything. I'd say, Luke, I want to be right here. 
who do you want to be with, Jim? I want to be with these kids. What do you want to yeah. be doing? I want to be teaching them. I want to be with these kids. I want to teach them. And, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. There's nothing I'd rather be doing. There's nobody I'd rather be with. That's what you want in life. That is a formula for happiness. You ask yeah. yourself, what is the bottom line? I don't want to do anything but do this. Now, talking about Thanksgiving and all that, <laughs> I was having more fun than you guys. <laughs> this was, well, I, I want to hear about that. Well, yeah. because the thing now, I was exploiting the situation, which is they put our meditation group in the library building, which was separate from all the rest of the school. Which, so, did they do that because we were rowdy or what? I don't know. <laughs> they, there's many reasons they might have done it. I think it's possibly, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, The Great Escape. In The Great Escape movie, the Germans put all the worst prisoners from all the prison camps in one camp. All the prisoners that would try to escape, all the prisoners that were rowdy. Let's get them all in one place where we can control them. So they might have done that, and then they might have given me, because they actually knew I actually liked those kids, you know? <laughs> So the idea is, okay, we're alone in here. I can do whatever I want <laughs> and I'm going to have fun. And so I would have, I mean, and then you guys were so great because you weren't inhibited. <laughs> you know, students get inhibited and they're too concerned about looking cool and being cool. And when you're in eighth grade, ninth grade, you don't care about that seventh grade. So I would have the kids, I would have them boogie in. I would like have them dance in as I was taking attendance. I would have you guys do the inverted crab walk races around the books. We did a weigh-in before Thanksgiving with the understanding that if all of you as a group could gain 50 pounds over Thanksgiving vacation, I would bring in, what, pies or donuts or something. That's right. Uh, but I was having a wonderful time. And we had good meditations. This is an important thing to remember. It's that yeah. We were having fun, but we did do the meditation, and it was good. Yeah. And uh, the idea was that um, we could... Um, be spontaneous and have a feeling of uh, possibilities uh, that were completely consistent with the environment. We couldn't have done that if we were in the bigger school. We prob probably would have bothered people and all. Yeah, that. yeah. So, well, I, I love that. That um, everything that's wonderful about meditation. There's no reason why that should be exclusive from uh, you know living a, a fun, full, exactly and joyous life. That's it. It was so much fun. I remember Ma Ma Maharshi said, "Look, we have." He said this. This is one of the quotes that we know he said. He said, "We have a serious responsibility." not to be serious. Okay? I love that. And we have a serious responsibility to enjoy life. You know, it's, it's, it's really important to just have that idea that there are no prescriptions now for how to live your life. It's just meditate and enjoy. Yeah, and I think you really taught by example. I mean, the, the generosity that you gave to all of your students, not just in time and energy, but, you know, donuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dollars to donuts. That's exactly, that's so funny. I would always say that. <laughs> right. I'll bet you dollars to donuts. Uh, that's awesome. I can tell you a few things about I, Yeah. <clears throat> Yo, go ahead. I mean, I think the idea here is <clears throat> history was really important to me. That's what I majored in in college. I got a master's degree at Columbia University in American Studies. I did understand that history had, a history teacher had an extra responsibility, and that was to imbue students with an understanding of the history and culture of the country they're living in with the idea that they would take some responsibility for the future of that country and have an understanding that the future of the United States actually depends on them. Mm. It's not what you're reading in the history book. It's what kind of future do you want to see this country achieve and how might I take a part in it? You know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And so if you are screaming and yelling and denouncing, condemning this person and that person and this thing and that thing, 
you need to turn your attention on yourself because that's the only way you can make any change. You're the one you have control over. And if you try to be better in the world, you're a better version of yourself, we're going to have a better future if enough people do that. So, you know, I did have those ideals. Much easier to teach them to younger kids than older kids. A lot of older kids would say, hey, he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what is he talking about? I'm, I'm more concerned about lunch or what I'm doing this weekend. And, sure, yeah. sure. One of the guideposts I think that, that has stuck with me, like I didn't think much of it at the time, but you said that current events will always be reflected in the art and the music and the literature. And myself being an artist and, and um, wanting to convey something that, that's really meaningful and true. That, I mean, that's how this podcast was born, you know, uh, because I'm seeing this breakdown of society and communication just on my Facebook newsfeed. Like it's, it's overwhelming in the sense that I just want to have a conversation with the people that, that really made a difference in my life. Is there a personal philosophy that you have that kind of carried you through all this, all these years of teaching? I think you already kind of touched on it, but yeah, it is good. I, I did already touch on it. There's so many important points that you've raised. Just this uh, last uh, point that you made is so important. Art history is more important than any other form of history. Actually, the history of our culture and the history of our politics and the history of our economics are a part of the art of that era. You just need to learn how to train your eye to see it. And the history, the facts, the battles, the dates, all of that stuff you're gonna forget. But the essence of history is, is in art. Another thing, an important thing is Art always shows us the greatness of our spirit, the greatness of our spirit. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that nothing could be more true, and it's true of music too. And so history, often we don't see the greatness of our spirit through learning about history. We do in learning about culture and learning about art and learning about music and appreciating them, really, really important. I did believe, I still believe that the teacher's job is as important as any other job, more important than many jobs, because we're talking about human potential. We're talking about the potential of each of those students in your class and reaching their potential and making a, a life that has that noble quality of purpose and a, a meaning and purpose through evolution of, of, of improving and growing spiritually. And education has a role, a teacher has a role in that. And to be a part of that is very, very uh, rewarding. You know, it's, it's the teacher gets more than the student does. But there's an enormous responsibility too, and you said it, to be an example. Um, because I could talk all day or I could give my opinions all day. None of that matters if I can't be an example of it. And I think one of the most important things as students get older is they recognize that teacher is one person in the classroom, but they may be somebody quite different outside that classroom. And with me, the dichotomy was very strong. In a classroom, I was a confident person. I was a self-possessed person. I was an interdirected person. I knew what I was doing. I knew why I was doing it, and it was obvious. I was born to teach. Outside a classroom, not so much. I could be very insecure, given the social situation. I could be full of doubt. I could be feeling anxious and uncomfortable. Mm. I could be depressed. I could be all kinds of things that would show my students how human I am <laughs> and how different I could be. Sure. I could be in or outside of a classroom. And so that's something that you wouldn't probably see 7th, 8th, or ninth grade. 10th, 11th, and 12th, you might see it more. Mm. And then if you get to know somebody better in a small community, you sort of know, well, hey, that person's human. They were my teacher. 
they were one person, I understood how they are, but now I understand them in the larger context. They're just another human being. Yeah. And they've actually, you know, going through many of the same things I've gone through and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I wonder what your, your, uh, what your take is on, on the current climate of things. Oh, yeah. Well, the, I mean, it like say I was in your class today. Yeah. How right? do you explain Donald Trump? I mean, how do you how do you put him in the context of American history? Um, where is the continuity? How do you explain the inconsistencies you see in the way he understands the role of president of the United States. And I think example is very, very important because he often appears to be and really is a bully. The way he treats even the weaker people that he comes in contact with, if they disagree with him, his lack of responsibility, his dishonesty, his um, comments even recently about dominating these protesters, bringing in the military, you know, you know if, it, if they start uh, protesting, you know, then you start shooting. I mean, just really irresponsible things. But even having said that, Donald Trump isn't all bad. It's a big mistake to think that he is. It's a big mistake to think that everything he says and does is bad, that he has no good instincts, that he doesn't try to be a good president in his own way. He actually does. But here is the example I want to give you. This man, just as I was born to teach but had to work at it to be good at it, it was important to me, this man should never have been president. One way I know is when you are a president. You have that in you. It's like you. You were an artist. That's who you are. That was true of you when you were 10. It's true of you now. It brings out the best in you. And everybody will say that. It's bringing out the best in Luke, that he has got both feet in his artist career. He's got all kinds of channels for his creativity. He's growing as an artist. He's moving in different directions. Trump is not, he is not, this is not bringing out the best in him. It's bringing out the worst in him. Mm. It, it, what he, he really should be an executive and a business and a real estate. That's what he's good at. It brings out the best in him. I will tell you, I've actually, this has been a mistake in some ways. I know Donald Trump. I know him personally. I played tennis with him. I spent a whole afternoon with him. I spent a whole summer teaching his really? son, Donnie Jr. Yeah, I taught Donnie Jr. swimming lessons in 1982. No Yes, kidding. I spent all summer <laughs> with Ivana you and Donnie that. Jr. And somebody was in the crib there. Maybe it was Ivanka. He came over and played tennis. We had a great time. I really liked him. He's a good guy. He could have treated me like a servant. He didn't. He treated me like... Uh, another guy, and uh, he was friendly. Um, and this was in I, Brooklyn. This was in 1982 in Wayne Scott, Long Island, okay. which is very, that can sound very posh now. Back then it wasn't so much, but it was East Hampton, Long Island, the so-called Hamptons. Georgica Association at that point was becoming extremely exclusive. Very wealthy people were moving in. Uh, he was uh, renting a house from Michael Kennedy, who ended up being Ivana's lawyer in the divorce. You know, <laughs> oh all God. kinds of stuff like that. Um, that's a whole nother story. Well, is, I'm kind of curious about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, anybody would be, but it's not that unusual. Sure. I'll give you another example. I yeah. actually, I taught the children of Paul McCartney. So people, well, Paul McCartney, he's a Beatle. I, I taught... Uh, Mary, little Mary. I taught Stella, who's the uh, fashion designer. Not a big deal. I'm an 18-year-old. I've just finished uh, my high school career. I've gone out to Long Island where I grew up in the summers. I have a job teaching swimming. Jody Eastman is my boss. Jody Eastman is the wife of John Eastman, who is the brother of Linda Eastman, who is married to Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney comes out for the summer with his kids. It's a natural thing that he would put them in the swimming classes. Um, 
It's good I had enough of an idea of being a responsible swimming teacher that I didn't treat them any differently. In fact, with Heather, the older one, wanted to be in a swimming competition. She was too old. Everybody's bugging me. Let Heather McCartney into the swimming competition. I wouldn't do it. She's too old. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not consistent. Mm. So I taught Estee Lauder's grandchildren. You know, these are names that would be very household names, very important names. But this is what was shifting in the Georgica Association when I turned 18 now. I'm no longer a kid growing up in the association where there weren't people like that. There were just normal people, professors and insurance executives and things like that. So, wow. so when I started working for the association, it shifted. When I started teaching tennis, uh, it shifted. And that was a good experience too because I had to learn to keep my head on straight, not act like an idiot around famous people, and not talk about them either. You know, like... Because that's the way to, you know, attract attention, right? I'm teaching these important people, their kids, and then gossip about them or something like that. Well, I, I think, you know, just treating people like human beings. Exactly. You know, like when I, when I reached out to you, part of the impetus for this show was just giving a voice to, uh, like, to all of us in a way that, you know, I, I listen to some of those other shows on YouTube and... It's like, okay, well, I'm just hearing a bunch of celebrities go back and forth. And I actually want to hear from like down to earth, real, yeah, genuine people who are doing really inspiring stuff. Because um, I think we all have, have that in us. But so you were doing that out in New York. What brought you to Fairfield? Yeah, that's so interesting um, that you bring that up. It's so important to emphasize what TM meant to me. Because I told you before, I, you know, in a classroom, confident, self-possessed, a lot of poise, sense of humor. I'm happy to be there. You're seeing my best self. You're seeing my best self. Outside the classroom, not so much. Now, the contrast might not be that much. The truth for me is in high school, growing up in high school, I mean, I probably should be a little bit careful, but I was a big drinker recreational drug use, lots of uh, issues that were, when I, when I say they were uh, at a stage that I wasn't so aware of, but this was not a good course I was taking in life. I was not making good choices. It, they weren't healthy choices. I was getting in trouble and I was leaving high school, going to what I considered to be a very good college, uh, not very stable, not doing well. Just at that point in my life, my brother is on his way to teacher training, and he tells me, look, Jim, you can go on for three hours. I'll listen to you about your problems, but you've got to understand TM is watering the root. You can get away from trying to understand your problems. You can get away from that darkness and just turn on the light. This is the answer, the second element, learn TM. Well, he could have said anything to me, the difference in him. He was the same as me. He was recreational drugs, lots of drinking in high school. He went to Harvard, a really brilliant guy, but he was, he was gonna hit a wall. He was gonna have a nervous breakdown. Now I'm doing the same thing. He looks like a million bucks. He's off drugs, he's off alcohol, he looks great, he's happy, he has peace inside. Hands me $60, says learn TM. That was in June of 74. And just for our listeners, TM is? Transcendental Meditation. Yeah. Of course, the technique, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi founded the Transcendental Meditation Program. And so when I get to uh, August of that year, that was the year I was teaching swimming, I was absolutely determined to learn TM. And I did change some of my habits a little bit, but basically I was on course for a real problem when I got to my freshman year. August 10th, 1974, I learned TM. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this was as great and more uh, even greater than what my brother said. I had this sense of peace. I had this sense of integration. I didn't feel like I needed those recreational drugs or the alcohol. I didn't need any of that stuff. I could be happy without it. And I'd like to say that I just changed my life forever. It didn't. It took me a long time to put that emphasis where it needed to be, which they often call the highest first. Take care of this. Do this meditation regularly. If you do it, 
you'll begin to make healthier and better choices because you're happier inside. You're not depending on things outside of you to be happy. Most of what I did, you know, alcohol and recreational drugs, that was to escape. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I wanted to get out of who I was, be somebody else in a different state of consciousness. With this, I want to be who I am. I like who I am. I'm happy inside. Mm. And so it took a while, but that probably saved me. That probably got me through college. And then ever after that, even when I became a teacher, I was always thinking, I want to become a TM teacher. I want to teach in a Maharshi school. I want to be part of a community of meditators and really get a chance to grow uh, spiritually and understand uh, that, that TM uh, can have this uh, role in my life where um, I'm not thinking, well, I'm not thinking about that, I'm doing it. Which is, yeah. when you get older, you see, this is the thing. You go, I have to stop thinking about doing I have to stop thinking about giving up drinking or giving up alcohol mm. or giving up caffeine. I want to mm. stop thinking about it. I don't want to do it. I want to be on the other side and yeah. explore what life is like not doing those things. Okay. <laughs> Hope I didn't go on too No, long. I love that. Um, in those earlier years, I mean, did you, did you do like Woodstock? What? I was too young for Woodstock. I was 13. Uh, in 69, I was 13. That was August, <clears throat> late August of 1969. 69 was an incredible year because right at the same time, we have the moon landing. We have the first American astronaut stepping on the moon, and we have Fake Woodstock. News. No, um, I'm just kidding. No, no, what did you say? <laughs> Fake news. Fail yeah, fake news. No, no I know, I know. I'm I love kidding. that. I love that. I, I've had a conversation with somebody who's sure that that's fake news. But the truth is, there was this, there was this paradigm shift in our culture, which was really good. It was talking about the environment. It was talking about freedom. It was a lot of exploring with drugs, which is actually, I'm not advocating drugs at all, but that kind of sincere, earnest exploration of a new experience, a new feeling of consciousness, you know, that isn't the worst thing in the world. It's the abuse of it. So when you see this concert, you know, 400,000 people, nobody gets hurt. There are no fights. Everybody's enjoying the music. Uh, you know, you see, wow, this could be a new age. You know, this, this could be the age of Aquarius and all that. But I'm still young. I was totally into sports then. I didn't like the idea of being in mud or it raining. And then I was just too young. But as I got older, uh, that culture sort of deepened, the drug culture deepened, and the exploration and the sincerity and the earnestness left. And it became um, way more destructive without even uh, people realizing it. You know, the, the Mansons happened in 69 too. You know, this was, this was a, uh, a year that in a sense had all the seeds of what the future were going to be. Um, I didn't even have long hair by then. By my senior year, when I was starting my senior year, I had hair down to my shoulders and a big beard. You know, I, that, was, that was not unusual. Um, I shaved it all off to play football, but <laughs> that was a little bit of what uh, culturally that experience was. There was a dichotomy in my life because I always dressed. I mean, this is interesting. The way I'm dressed, it's a little bit like preppy. You know, you'd see something like uh, Land's End or whatever. I always dressed that way, but I was every bit as much of a hippie in my habits as my brother <laughs> who had hair down to his shoulders, jean jacket, cowboy, cowboy boots, you know, the whole thing. So I didn't look the part, but I was definitely playing the part. That's awesome. Wow. Um, you know, you brought up Trump, and I, I'm curious uh, who you thought was perhaps the most inspiring president we've had at oh, being that's a such teacher a good question. of history. But. Yeah, I love talking about that. See, John F. Kennedy will always be, he has a mystique, and there is some myths regarding him. He wasn't perfect, but I've got to tell you, <laughs> he was the epitome of the kind of leader we needed. He had courage to spare. He was honest. He understood why our government was getting incredibly corrupt, corrupted by the military industrial complex, corrupted by crazy ideas of an evil Soviet Union, which was never true, and doing things like the Bay of Pigs and talking about getting into Vietnam and he was going to stop it. I guarantee you he was going to stop 
Vietnam. He was careful. He didn't get ahead of himself. He didn't want other people to be embarrassed politically. He was very adroit, pragmatic. He was going to get us out of Vietnam. He's assassinated. We go into Vietnam. Unbelievable commitment of money and soldiers and people. Vietnam was a complete disaster. This is an indefensible war in American history. And a lot of people understand that now. We killed two million Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians. Two million civilians were killed by U.S. bombs and bullets. For what? For absolutely nothing. It's like John Kerry said, how do you get somebody to die for a mistake? John Kennedy was going to keep us uh, you know, from getting into that war, Robert F. Kennedy was going to get us out of it. And I mean out of it. Within three months of becoming president, we would have been out of Vietnam. Nixon has a plan. I have a plan. It's a secret plan to get us out of Vietnam. 1968, 1975, seven years later, it took for us to get out of Vietnam. And Andrew Perry's grandfather was one of the last pilots to fly out of the uh, you know U.S. embassy. The Andrew Perry. Andrew Perry's grandfather, wow. his mother's father, was one of the last pilots Incredible. to fly out of Vietnam. Wow. So Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, great leaders. Many of the potential great leaders don't want to be president and don't become president. Um, I could give you others that I consider great leaders, but they weren't uh, presidents. Yeah. Interesting. Well, so, I mean, where do we go from here? Beautiful. This is such a good question. Irresistible yeah. force. The country is changing right now. A lot of people thought 2012 was going to be the big shift, you know, the Mayan calendar, all that. It's happening right now. It's an irresistible force. It cannot be stopped. The truth is the baby boomers are done. They shouldn't even be running for president. This is not their time. This is a new century with a new direction, with a new generation that will take over this country, will absolutely set it straight, we should have done something about the environment. We should have done something about the military industrial complex. We should have done something about perpetual war. We should have done something about racism. We should be much further along. This country is getting wider and wider in the gaps of rich and poor. It is a joke to consider uh, what uh, the uh, uh, consequences have been of uh, the 2008 meltdown when we bailed out those banks. Those banks were responsible. They're people who should have been on trial for what happened in 2008. All of that, this is the watershed. This, this is the catharsis. And basically, it's the end of the baby boomers. It's the end of the 20th century. It's the beginning of the 21st century. Your generation... <laughs> There will be things done about the environment. <clears throat> there will not be the kind of racist events that we've seen recently. Our military budget is going to be cut. Everybody's going to have health care. There's going to be uh, education. These uh, debts uh, that all these students, young people have, these huge tuition, those things will be removed. We're going to have to join the family of nations. And this very corrupt very distorted idea of American exceptionalism, which is based on our military power and our wealth. It's hollow, it's shallow, it's transparent, and it's got to stop. It is absolutely ridiculous, and it does. It makes people say, America never was great. What are you talking about? Making America great again. We never have been great, not since World War II. You know, if we want to be great, we need to start being great in the ways that people are great. And it's not by wealth. It's not by military power. Now, when I say we never were great, there's many great things about Americans and great things about American history. I love the country, but uh, it's time we start telling the truth. You yeah. know, this is the problem. Well, do you think that like this quote unquote, like American dream it yeah. is somehow really kind of distorted exactly and, and got us here this, Absolutely. this notion of uh you go out you kind of carve a path or whatever right. it is and you make your dreams come true and it, it just it seems so shrouded in in greed yeah and and, and power mongering so so what, what what's the right. alternative what's the model because obviously we point. want to be free that's a beautiful point well <laughs> see what you're seeing is what you're 
yeah, you're spot on, Luke. There's a dark side to capitalism, and I am not a communist, but there is a dark side to capitalism that's predatory. It is predatory. It is like bullies picking on weaker people. It's people with money getting more money, people without money getting less money. If you want to get into a hedge fund, you need $600,000, for instance. If you want to get into the bigger and best investments in this country, you need to already have money. And the people that already have money just become richer and richer. The people who don't get a second, third, and fourth job, and they don't have health care. They can't, uh, they can't. I'll give you an example. In 2008, with the mortgage crisis, the adjustable rate mortgages that they sold, all these lower middle class and middle class people who couldn't afford them. So, okay, it tanks. It's a disaster. It goes bankrupt. Who do they bail out? But those banks, they give billions of dollars to the banks. They should have been giving those billions of dollars to those people who had those mortgages. They should have given them more time to pay off the mortgages. They should have reduced the amount they had to pay. They should have helped those millions of people instead of those huge banks. That's the kind of thing we do in this country. When the truth comes out about the stimulus payments during the you know coronavirus, during a COVID-19, all this billions of dollars going out. The truth comes out, those billions were going to corporations with no restrictions. They could buy back their stock. They could do whatever they want. They could give themselves bonuses. That money should have been going. Each American should have been getting $2,000 every month during that time. Your generation has been unbelievably shafted by the last 20 years. The country you're growing in doesn't not only have an American dream, it's, a, it's like an American uh, uh, disaster that takes a while to understand. I mean, your, your generation has unbelievable amounts of college debt, graduate school debt. You're trying to get good jobs and there aren't any. Uh, there's no health care. There's no health insurance. We've destroyed the environment. Basically, we're giving you a country that is falling apart. You didn't have any of the advantages that my generation had, which was an incredible economy with great jobs, with really very little student debt, and an environment that wasn't tanked yet. So, you know, you have all these reasons to want to change in a radical way. Uh, the, the kinds of uh, policies our government pursues. Bernie Sanders is spot on. In many ways, he's spot on. He's too far radical left, but at least he's a, a, a bellwether for the direction that we need to go in. Um, as you know, I can go on and on about that, and I hope that uh, that sounds coherent. <laughs> I wasn't, no, it really I does. I didn't have notes about that. And it's funny because, like, I, I was a Bernie supporter for a while. Um, it just seemed like his popularity was through the roof, and then he just completely just kind of disappeared. They took him down. I they, mean, I yeah. don't. I, there's no conspiracies here, but they basically took him down. They took him down because they were sure he couldn't beat Trump. Um, and they took him down because all the other candidates decided to go in with Biden at a critical time right before the South Carolina primary, where you knew Bernie wasn't going to do well. Now, the truth is, Bernie did very well. He was doing well way after the South Carolina primary, and a lot of people were still voting for him. And if he stayed in the race by the Democratic National Convention, he would have a lot of delegates and a lot of leverage. But Bernie understands too, look, this is about defeating Trump. He's not going to be, he doesn't want president. He's not hungry for power. He's not hungry for yeah. prestige. And you know, Biden, okay, Biden, he's a good uh, alternative. Uh, I can get behind Biden. The important thing is to win the election in November and uh, remove uh, Trump from office. Again, I don't hate Trump, but this is essential. We need to do this, an important step. And then the Democratic Party has a lot to answer for, too. You know, this is making the Republicans all the bad guys. They're all basically funded by, by corporate interests. Their campaigns are paid for by corporate interests. A lot of people that talk about that, well, they're right. Uh, you know, this is a plutocracy. There, the money is controlling the government. It's controlling the course of our history. And you're right. Basically, greed is the problem. Last thing I'll say that I love that mm. you said about the American dream. This is an important...
important thing to reconcile. What was the dream as an ideal? What was the dream in reality? The uh, amazing book, The Great Gatsby, uh, by F. Scott Fitzgerald, is talking about this. You know, Jay Gatsby, he wants the American dream, and he wants to have this wonderful life, and he doesn't know how to get it. And the truth is, it's a an illusion. There is no answer that, that it comes with material values. There has to be a balance of spiritual and material values for any quality of life. Uh, and the American dream is just, um, it's better to let it go. Let the, yeah. Let that dream go. It's an illusion anyway, at least the way it was formed. Yeah, cool. I, I appreciate that. I'm like... <clears throat> Like, I just want to grow vegetables in my garden <laughs> and like yeah. see my friends across the street doing right. well. And I think we're incredibly lucky to be here in Fairfield. Like, uh, we were talking off camera about how um, it feels like a general trend that more people are probably going to leave their, their big city life for something a little more rural. And that's certainly why I've stayed in Fairfield as long as I have. I mean, I was born and raised here. But it's affordable, and I'm an artist. I'm not trying to spend two thousand dollars a month on rent. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to do that. You know, it's like I'm. Just, I'm just trying to balance a creative life, a good life, with, you know, organic fruits and vegetables. Right. And <laughs> those those values are actually, they're grounded in natural law. Not to get into <laughs> movement speak too much here, but they're grounded in eternal values. The values of food. The values of of growing your own food, the value of a balanced life uh, economically, being more concerned about the community you live in and the quality of life than the kind of summer home that you have or the ski place that you go to. You know, having those ideas that the quality of your life is balancing those spiritual values with material values and then finding channels to grow through your creativity as an artist, I mean, this is how we achieve happiness. It's through the fulfillment and the happiness we experience, what we're doing, what we always wanted to do. And we have the courage to go for what we really want and what we know will be uh, a happier and healthier life. And, and I think more and more people are going to understand that. I think it's really important to um, be growing in ways that challenge some of your boundaries, that uh, make you uh, see things from new perspectives. Um, travel is really good for that. And so I believe the quality of life is wonderful in Fairfield, but I totally get and reinforce that so many people your age have traveled so much around the world and gotten that education. You know, Confucius said better to travel 10,000 miles than read 10,000 books. Mm -hmm. That education is irreplaceable. And it really helps you develop a set of values that aren't just based on America and American culture, but from all the places you've been, from all the people you've met all over the world, seeing how people live and coming back and saying, this is what's important to me. And this is how I want to live. And I'm not going to buy into this material value of the United States, this greed, uh, that we have to all be in the 1%. And that, that's the winner. The loser is the person who didn't join the 1%. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, uh, again, I just, just like if, if you go on YouTube, it's saturated in this. I th the most popular YouTube channels are sporting the new Lamborghini, the new yes. this, the new that. So flashy and so loud and obnoxious, really. I right. keep... I keep reminding my listeners and my, and my friends that I drive a Toyota Matrix and I love it. I just drop the seats down. I can put an eight foot ladder in there and a bunch of mulch and gravel. So yeah, <laughs> um, point A to point B, point right? A to point B. It's perfect. It suits my purposes. If I get a little scratch on the, on the hood, doesn't matter. Yeah. It's but, okay. It's like, a, it's having that change because it's okay to have a Mercedes Benz. I mean, it's okay to have really nice things, but you're not um, directed by the need for or the craving of these things. They are secondary to that sense of fulfillment that you have because you could easily live without it. 
I mean, why, why were these uh, stockbrokers jumping off uh, buildings when the stock market crashed? Because they had gotten used to living a certain way. They just couldn't accept being a failure mm, in the eyes yeah. of other people or in themselves, you know. And anyway, it, I think you understand. It's mm. true. That's great. Well, <clears throat> I wonder if you... Uh... If you had like one piece of advice for your younger self, oh yeah, good. for the people that um, that are coming up now, uh, uh, my, myself included, and perhaps even younger people, what what's your best piece of advice for them? Well, that's so great that you asked me. I used to have my students uh, do interviews of older people, people my age when they were in ninth grade, and that was the last. That was the only question I said I want you to ask. Mm. Ask them for some advice. And so many of them said, you know, do what you love. Don't buy into do what you love because you'll be spending your life doing that. And, you know, if you become a lawyer, you don't want to be a doctor. You don't want to be, you'll be sorry. But my one thing I want people to understand about life that's really true from my side now at 65, we cannot understand life as we're living it. The tension often is I want to know perfectly, understand perfectly who I am, where I'm at, what I should do. I want the answers. And the truth is we have to get comfortable without, not, without having them. We don't understand life as it's happening. We understand it in retrospect. We understand it looking back. So the idea is to do the best you can in the present to live your values Live what's most important to you. Have a set of core values that guide your decisions, principles that you believe in, that you try to uphold, because if you do that, you'll never regret it. You'll know you were trying to do the right thing. You were trying to be the good person. You were trying to grow. And so that is the most important thing in the present. Don't worry too much about how well you understand what's happening. You'll understand it in the future mm. looking back. And when you realize, I was consistent with, I had the integrity and the courage to live what is most important to me. I did not become a hypocrite. I didn't compromise my most important values. Or if I did, I got up and tried harder to, to not do that. You know, this, this is the important thing uh, in life. There's, there's no regrets if you're true to yourself, true to your highest values. So that's what I would say about that. And that's about awesome. other people, let people be who they are. <laughs> <laughs> that's so wonderful. Yeah. Gosh, I'm so honored to have you on this podcast. And oh, well, thanks I, so much. I just want to thank you for being um, just a wonderful uh, mentor and, and inspiration in my life. Thank um, you so much. I, I think people, I hope they really enjoyed this episode. I think I got a lot out of it, and I hope they did too. But um, yeah, you're just such an eloquent speaker. You're fun. You're smart and uh, keep on doing what you're doing. It works. Thanks. And thanks so much for like uh, impacting, <laughs> you know? impacting my life positively. Yeah. It's yeah. Really thank great. you so much, Luke. Thanks for being here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, I don't even awesome. know how long that was.